Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic, we're going to give a brief introduction to the axiomatic method. So, in this topic, we will introduce and describe the axiomatic method. Specifically, we will look at Euclid's po uh, postulates, or axioms, and propositions that he deduced from these postulates, or axioms. We will then look at how we can use the axiomatic method in this course. Now, the axiomatic method is quite straightforward. It's just an approach. Basically, you make some assumptions that you cannot prove. We call these assumptions axioms. We then see what you can deduce or prove from the axioms. So any further properties you can prove are called theorems. One thing that's nice about a theorem is once a theorem is proven, you can use it in subsequent proofs. So you may have already done this in secondary school where you did some very elementary proofs and then you used the properties from those proofs in subsequent proofs. Now, the first example, that still exists today at least, of someone attempting to apply the axiomatic method is the work we know as Euclid's Elements. Now, Euclid wrote down a number of definitions, starting with a point is that which has no part meaning you can't really divide a point into two separate parts. Uh, unlike a line, you can, given a line, you can always break a line into two line segments. Uh, next, a line is breathless width. Okay, uh, that's sort of a dodgy definition, but hey, sure. And the ends of a line are points. All right, and he had that and 20 other such definitions. Euclid then also wrote some common not notions. Uh, we would actually describe these today as axioms. So he begins with, things which equal the same thing are also equal to each other. And so we would say if, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Next, he assumed, if equals are added to equals, then the wholes are equal. So this basically says if A equals B and C equals D, then A plus C is equal to B plus D. Uh, similarly, he says that equal, if equals are subtracted from equals, then the remainders are also equal. Yeah, you can probably see that. Uh, things which coincide with one another are equal. And finally, the whole is greater than the part. All right, straightforward enough. Euclid then introduced five axioms. And if you studied this in secondary school, he, you would have seen them being described as postulates. The first is it is possible to draw a straight, straight line from any given point to any other point. Similarly, if you have a line segment that goes from one point to another point, it is possible to extend that out in a straight line. That's reasonable. He then had three additional axioms. You can review these yourself if you wish. Now, after this, Euclid then went on to deduce hundreds of other propositions. We now call these theorems, and each of these is proved based on the given axioms that we see here. The very first theorem in his text is that it is possible 
to construct an equilateral triangle on any given finite straight line. All right. So let's assume we have two points. We can connect those two points with a straight line. Next, that line defines a radius. So I can construct a circle centered at the first point that has that radius. Similarly, I can construct a circle that has that same radius centered around the second point. And now those two circles must intersect. And that intersection is a third point. Now, I can connect that third point with the first point, and the length of that line must be the same as the length of the original line. Similarly, I can connect the third and second points, and that must also give me a line segment that has the same length as the first two line segments. Consequently, this defines an equilateral triangle. All right, this was his first theorem, and if you wanted to, you could go through Euclid's elements and look at each subsequent theorem that he deduced from these axioms. Thus, given a set of axioms, one of the goals of mathematics is to go forward and to try to prove as many theorems as possible. One thing that's nice is once you use and prove a theorem, you may then use that theorem in subsequent proofs to find additional theorems. What's actually very nice is that if you have a set of axioms, and you find any system that satisfies these axioms, all the theorems must also be true. That's actually very powerful, because what that says is, if you just base all your proofs on a simple set of axioms, then afterwards, if you find something else that seems to look the same way, then all of the other proofs automatically follow. What we're going to do in this class is we are going to start by finding the minimal number of axioms that are necessary to have useful properties of the rational and real numbers. What's very nice is then we will introduce something called complex numbers and we will show that complex numbers satisfy the same axioms which basically means you will understand that you can treat complex numbers in more or less all the same ways that you already understand that you can interact with rational and real numbers in algebra. Following this, we will introduce axioms for vectors, and then we will see that these are those properties of vectors that are absolutely necessary. This is going to be the basis for the rest of the course, where we will look at vectors and matrices, and we will have numerous theorems and proofs that will describe the properties of vectors and matrices. We will then see throughout the course that there are other systems that satisfy the same axioms as vectors, and thus, literally, have the same properties. And you're going to be a little bit surprised, but this includes polynomials and functions in general. But that's in the future. Okay, so following this topic, you now understand the idea of an axiomatic system. You have reviewed a simple proof of a theorem from Euclid's Elements. You understand that we will be using this approach in this course, and we will use this approach to deduce many theorems 
about vector spaces and matrices, or linear transformations. And you have an inkling as to the idea that there are more than just the two- and three-dimensional vectors you saw in secondary school. Here's the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!